Hello, welcome to the video. This one's about the classic albums of the pub rock era. And it's not just about bands who played in pubs, because obviously most bands, especially the ones who weren't very, very famous, played in pubs. This is about the sound of the era and the influential music of the time. And believe me, we can look down on pub rock now. Yeah. But at the time, and in retrospect, it was a very exciting era in British music. So let's get into this. It's going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be roughly the 1970s. The second part is going to be roughly the 1980s. The two periods of pub rock, as we, we all know. Yes, we know that, don't we? We are the aficionados of the pub rock era. If you like this, by the way, please like, comment, let me know what you think, and um, subscribe. If you're not already subscribed, because you never know, I might do something that you enjoy one day. No chance. Well, the first album of pub rock we're going to talk about is Japanese by Mickey Jupp. If I held your hand last night, it was because the moon was bright. Now, putting aside the um, questionable picture on the front, it was a different era, wasn't it? And I'm sure he didn't mean any disrespect. It's an album of two parts, really. The first part is like the rock pile side, and the second part is the more studio side, which was produced by Gary Booker of Procol Harum. Because Mickey Jupp came from Southend, he was a very influential character in Southend. When you went to see him, his shows were always very good, and I don't know anybody that went to see Mickey Jupp who came out disappointed. He was one of the most professional people of the era, and he's still going now. He sent me a message after I mentioned him in a previous video, so I hope you will, Mick, if you're watching. And so, Japanese is one of my favourite albums from that era, and it came out in 1978 on Stiff Record. The second album we're going to talk about today is <laughs> Nervous on the Road by Bruce Lee Schwartz. I was not worried. When you went to see Bruce Lee Schwartz, you couldn't help but notice how, again professional, I'm going to use that word again. Nick Lowe obviously was the main creative force behind it. He certainly wrote most of the songs, certainly most of the better songs. And on the album there's a track called Surrender to the Rhythm, which to me was the whole spirit of pub rock and independent music and the alternative scene at the time. But it was nothing more or less than another mess of the blue, the blue child. And I'll try and put little bits of um, snippets in for all these tracks. YouTube doesn't like you using other people's copyright. You can't really get permission, so I'll do the best I can. Anyway, what's next, you ask? Well, obviously the big album of the pub rock era was Stupidity by Dr. Feelgood. That's a stupid came out in 1976. It was their third album. It was a live album. The first side was, because back then, vinyl came with two sides, and it was played at 33 and a third RPMs, by the way. 99% 90%, 90 of the time. Occasionally, somebody brought it out a 78 or a 45, whatever, and the sound quality was enhanced, but that was mainly for people who went to Tangerine Dream and stuff like that. But generally speaking, it was 12-inch LPs. One side was one side and the other side, and you had to turn it over and play the other side. Now, if you already knew that I do apologize because a lot of people are young people and they tell me they don't know these things. The first side was recorded in Sheffield and the second side was recorded in South End. The first I think 200 copies or 2000 copies came with a single which featured a Chuck Berry song and that was recorded at Fires at Aylesbury just to make it more complicated. Now most of the songs were written by Wilco Johnson, but there were some covers on the album, including the title track, obviously Stupidity, by Solomon Burke, which is one of my favourite songs. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Solomon Burke, as I believe Wilco Johnson was, which is why they did that 
track live. Stupidity was the only Duffield Good album that went straight to at number one and it stayed there for one week. It had a strong competition at the time and I think it was the first live album ever to go straight in at number one. And believe it or not, by then, Dr. Feel Good had no single success. None of their singles they put out were successful. It was a bit later. It's very unusual at the time because normally what the way it worked was you did, did an album, then you put out a single from the album and then when that was a hit or if that was a hit, you then put the album out and the album would piggyback on the back of the single. But in this case, the album came out. Dr. Feel Good, there's a real vibe buzz about them at the time. They'd already moved out of the pub rock circuit. Both sides were recorded in big concert halls, but they were still embodying the spirit of pub rock. And I can remember Wilco Johnson, who I worked with afterwards, he hated playing in pubs. So there you go. That's another myth busted, isn't it? And who's next, you ask? Who's next? <laughs> The last album I'm going to talk about today is Teenage Depression by Eddie and the Hot Rods. Now, before we go any further, let me say, this is not a list of the best albums of the 1970s, because obviously, if so, there'd be Bob Marley in there and all kinds of things, right? This is about pub rock, so I'm putting in Eddie and the Hot Rods because they were an integral part of pub rock and the missing link, I would say, between pub rock and punk. And if anybody doesn't like that, then tough, because that is what it is. I first saw Eddie and the Hot Rods at the Nashville. They were doing a Saturday night residency alternating with somebody. I can't remember who they're alternating with, and I was blown away. A bit like Dr. Feelgood, except not quite as blown away, if you see what I mean. It was a totally different thing, and it took me a while to get into it, because it was a bit punky for the time. When you're used to seeing something like Basil's Balls Up Band at one night, straight R&B band the next night and then you go and see Eddie and the Hot Rods. It can be a bit of a culture shock. They were formed in 1975 by a guy called Dave Higgs who'd been with Lee Brillo in a band called The Fix and Barry Masters who was the lead singer. Now Barry unfortunately died three or four years ago. He was a very troubled man. He had a problem with drugs his whole life. He lost days and years of his life to drugs and I think eventually drugs claimed him. The last time I actually saw him was in Margate. I put on a show at the Winter Gardens with all sorts of bands and Barry was there with Eddie and the Hot Rods and he was not well then. He basically showed me his back which was like a mess of pus and let's not go into that. So when he died, which I think that was probably what he wanted to do, he was 63, but going back to teenage depression. make a huge dent in the charts. That It got to number 43 in the album charts, but it was the start of a lot of singles for Eddie and the Hot Rods, and they became quite successful. Then along came punk, and everything changed. So, there you go. That's all I've got to say, really, about this. There's loads more albums I might have mentioned, or could have mentioned, or maybe should have mentioned. Please comment down below. Let me know what you think I ought to have mentioned. And please, please, please bear in mind that it was supposed to be um, how these albums influenced the whole pub rock, or how they were indicative of the pub rock era. Thank you for watching. If you're not already subscribing, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.